event where we will be talking about impeachment. My name is Benjamin Morse and I'm here from the Center for Academic Innovation at the University of Michigan and today I'm joined in our studio by Barbara McQuaid who's a professor from practice at the University of Michigan Law School and former United States Attorney uh, for the Eastern District of Michigan. Thank you for joining us Barb. Thanks Benjamin. And I'm also joined in the studio by Richard Primus who's a professor of constitutional law at the University of Michigan uh, in the law school as well. Thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. Great, so this conversation today is building on University of Michigan's Understanding Impeachment Teach Out, uh, which is an online learning experience that's happening right now on Coursera. Uh, you can join hundreds of learners right now uh, within the Teach Out by following the link uh, that is in our description on the YouTube channel. And over the last couple of weeks, uh, Teach Out learners have had the opportunity to submit questions to Barb and to Richard uh, about impeachment and you know we'll answer those questions in just a minute uh, but before we do we want to encourage all of you who have tuned in live to submit questions of your own uh, so we will be monitoring Facebook YouTube and Twitter we'll be collecting questions uh, and they'll be coming through here so we can ask our, our two experts in this conversation uh, as we craft these questions uh, it's important to know that Rather than focusing on the current events and the current uh, inquiry here, this conversation aims to provide context by exploring the legal and the political processes of impeachment, uh, the history of impeachment here in the United States, and potential implications of impeachment moving forward. So let's jump into it. So Richard, can you start by quickly just explaining uh, the impeachment process, who's involved, what does the, the timeline look like? Sure, so in the US government, under the Constitution, impeachment is a constitutional process. The rules are set by the Constitution itself. And the rules are that impeachment is a process for the uh, investigation and potential removal uh, of officials, a limited set of officials, senior executive branch officials, and federal judges and that's about it. Members of Congress, for example, aren't subject to impeachment. They can be removed for misconduct by two-thirds votes of their own houses individually. It's a separate thing from impeachment. When someone is going to be impeached, the process is that things start in the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives has to vote by majority, just like most other things in the House, uh, and what the House does is actually the impeachment. So when we say the term impeachment, we're usually talking about the whole process altogether. Sure. But strictly speaking, impeachment just means accusation. Right? And that's the role of the House. It's the role that gets things going and says we now have to have a trial in the Senate. So the House of Representatives will conduct an investigation if it concludes that there is a, enough of a reason to think that maybe someone needs to be removed, that there needs to be a trial, then the House votes the impeachment and the official is impeached. Now the action shifts to the Senate and the Senate acts as the court of impeachment. The, the proceedings in the Senate usually involve people from the House of Representatives who are called managers who come over to explain the case for impeaching and removing the official who's the subject of the impeachment. Sure. Um, the Senate acts in a way that's analogous to the jury in a trial. Their decision is going to, in the end, decide whether the official is going to be removed or not. The Constitution specifies that the Senate needs a two-thirds vote for removal. Um, historically, uh, senators have just sat and listened during impeachment trials. Uh, it's not something senators usually do a lot, but they do it in this context. Um, and the impeachment is presided over in all cases but one by the Senate's own normal presiding officials, which now the, the vice president under the Constitution is the president of the Senate, which means if all the senators are there and we're doing like full dress Senate today, sure. the vice president is in the chair. Yeah. Right? The framers of the Constitution realized that it would not be a good idea to have the vice president be in charge of an impeachment trial when the person on trial was the president because the vice president has a conflict of interest in that situation. 
And the conflict of interest was even more acute in the way that they imagined the presidency than the way that we do, because our understanding is the vice president is usually the president's chief cheerleader. He's on the ticket, he's on the team. But of course, in the beginning, the way you chose a president and a vice president was that you had an election and whoever finished first was president and whoever finished second was vice president, which meant they could easily be set up to be rivals. And that means that you're putting the ch president's chief rival right in yeah. the presiding chair at the impeachment trial. The framers figured that was not a good idea. So they specified that when the president of the United States is tried, the chief justice right, of the United States, the leader of the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. sits in the chair. Um, Curi and that's how it's been done in each time that there's been a presidential impeachment. Curiously, the framers forgot to think about the case where the vice president is impeached, which means that one of the questions that people who think about these things often ask is, well, if the vice president is impeached, does he preside over his own trial? Right. There's no provision for that. Um, and it's never happened, so we don't know. But in the normal case, uh, the chief justice presides if the president is being impeached. Um, there is uh, uh, a, a case made, right? the Senate reviews the evidence before it, and it takes a vote. And if there's a two-thirds vote, then the official who is on trial is removed from office. And um, standardly, the removal from office comes also with a bar against future federal service, um, uh, not a bar on being elected to Congress, but a bar on what's called holding a position of uh, honor, trust, or profit under the United States, the same sorts sure. of things for which you could be impeached in the first place. Sure. There's some question about whether that consequence has to follow. Generally, it does. Mm -hmm. What we know for sure is no other consequence can follow. So the Constitution says that uh, judgment in cases of impeachment and removal cannot extend farther than removal from office and disqualification. There are no fines. There's no jail time. Sure. You're just out of office. Great. That's, that's super helpful to, to think through. And I know that as we're kind of seeing this current inquiry unfold before us, uh, there are a lot of other questions that are popping up about the process. And I think one of them that, that keeps coming up is we're, we're starting to see this shift now from uh, you know, closed door uh, de depositions and, and testimony, and now we're entering you know, what is gonna be a new phase of, of this process. Uh, can you help us understand this shift, Barb, and how this uh, more public facing uh, testimony is gonna gonna play out yes and I think one of the points that Richard makes that's so important to understanding all of this is the Constitution only has some very basic framework about how impeachment is supposed to work it says the house has the sole power of impeachment and that the trial occurs in the Senate this two-thirds vote and that's about it so it leaves a lot of room for the house to decide how it wants to handle impeachment um, we've got a little bit of history to rely on but not a whole lot um, and one of the things that's different about this uh, time around is that there hasn't been a special prosecutor, an independent counsel mm -hmm. to conduct the investigation. And so the House is serving kind of two functions, one as the investigator and then second as the decision maker as to whether to um, hand up an accusation in the form of, of an impeachment. I might equate it, based on my work in criminal law, to the work of a grand jury. A grand jury also has that dual function. They conduct an investigation where they hear evidence in secret. Um, sometimes it, it could be hours and hours of testimony that goes nowhere. And so, you know, we're hearing about these eight and 10 hour depositions. Mm -hmm. um, it's likely that from that, they will have some witnesses uh, who say maybe one hour worth of really important testimony out of the eight to 10 hours that they're actually there testifying. It may be that some witnesses come in and don't say anything that advances the investigation. Sure. There may be some that provide exonerating information. So all of that is important and useful, but it takes a lot of time and it's tedious. Um, and that's what has been going on to, to this point behind closed doors in these depositions. Um, we are now at the point where they want to go into what would be more of this accusatory phase, mm -hmm. where they're going to actually present some of the evidence um, for the public in public hearings, where people can get a sense for what this uh, evidence is. And then, and then the House will have to decide whether it mount, amounts to a high crime or misdemeanor for which impeachment is appropriate. And so um, I think that that's what we have going forward. And now we see a number of protections that have been implemented for the protection for the president, none of which are required, by the way. There's been a lot of outcry uh, by um, supporters of President Trump that his due process is being violated because he hasn't had it. It's all being done in secret, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, because there are no rules required, 
um, I would submit that there's been no violation, but I do think out of an abundance of um, caution, the appearance of fairness is really important to the public in feeling confidence in this process going forward. They have recently voted, the House, um, to improve, to provide some of these protections for President Trump, the ability to call witnesses, to cross-examine mm -hmm. witnesses, for example, um, and other things. But they did retain one really interesting um, power. Uh, we have seen a president who has been um, quite uh, recalcitrant in responding to requests through subpoenas and production of witnesses and the like. And so one of the provisions that was approved last week was the ability of the House to sanction the president. If he fails to produce witnesses and documents, they can, as a sanction, um, take away some of these rights that they have provided to him. That, that's really helpful. So I wanted to kind of bring up a couple learner questions that start start getting at some of the, the points that you're making. So Carla, uh, from inside the teach out asks, you know, what are the similarities and differences between impeachment and a criminal trial? And we had a question come in from YouTube um, asking about due process. So asking about what does the Constitution say um, ab about the president and uh, a Fifth Amendment right? Well, what the Constitution says about the president and the Fifth Amendment right in the impeachment context is nothing, not a word. Um, the president is not being subject to a criminal process. Right? Um, due process in the criminal context is extremely important because it's a fundamental value in our system that we try not to lock up innocent people. Right? Um, and so the system is structured with a lot of protections to make sure that as best as we can, innocent people don't get convicted. And on the premise that it's better as a general matter to make mistakes by not convicting guilty people than by convicting innocent people. We want to load the error in the direction of a false acquittal rather than a false conviction. None of that is at play in an impeachment. Um, nobody's liberty is at stake. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have uh, the same panoply of constitutional rights or protections because our goals are different. In, in an impeachment, um, it's not about the individual liberties of the person who's being impeached. Uh, you don't have the same liberty to hold on to the privilege of a federal office that you have to walk around free without being locked up. Um, the question that's being asked is, well, did the person do something that makes it important to get them out of the office? Uh, and the public interest there is different, and the, uh, the person's interest is different, and there's no such thing as, uh, as in a technical sense, as due process protection. Sure. That said, right, as Barb says, you want the process to be fair. Mm -hmm. You want a process that gets the right information rather than getting skewed information or prejudicial information. Mm -hmm. And so the process should be structured in a way that lets in as much information as can be helpful from either side. Um, uh, but it's not a question of the rights of the accused. It's just a question of what best helps us figure out what's going on and what needs to happen. Great. That's that's really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And along those lines, I think um, e even the processes that we will see play out in the trial, I think, are likely to be different because of the interest that Richard has identified. I mean, one of the complaints we've heard is, um, I, I think Lindsey Graham has famously said um, that uh, the whistleblower uh, has provided hearsay information and you can't even get convicted of a traffic ticket based on hearsay. Um, and I, I think it's important to understand a couple things. Number one, um, it's not clear that the rules of evidence apply at an impeachment proceeding. The Chief Justice will preside, and my guess is would want to do something akin to the rules of evidence to ensure that uh, evidence comes in fairly, uh, that we feel confidence in the process, but there is n no requirement that hearsay rules be enforced. Uh, that being said, um, oftentimes when you're handling a criminal investigation, cases begin with a tip from someone in the public that is by definition hearsay, an out of court declaration uh, used to prove the truth of the matter asserted. Um, that's not the evidence that gets presented at trial. That is just used to lead to uh, the discovery of admissible evidence. And so what would happen in a case where you get a tip from someone like that is you would look for firsthand information to confirm that from witnesses and documents that will be presented at the trial. So I wouldn't imagine that the whistleblower in the instance of the current matter um, would or should testify. Uh, the purpose of whistleblower protection laws is to protect the identity of whistleblowers and protect them from retaliation. What's important is the people that he identified who are firsthand witnesses um, and documents that they can uh, uncover text messages and other things that can be used as the evidence at the trial. And and it's also the case, it's important to remember, um, 
in our normal lives, we decide things and reach conclusions based on hearsay all the time, mm -hmm. right? Hearsay just means uh, you know, someone told me something, right? And I evaluate, and it, but it wasn't someone within that own person's experience. Maybe it was something that that person had read or that that person had heard. Um, and we make decisions all the time based on information like this that comes in because a lot of things that people tell us in life are true, right? Mm -hmm. And it's our job as we go through the day to try to figure out what that we hear is reliable and what isn't. There are a lot of places in the legal system where very important decisions are made and hearsay evidence is totally normal, totally admitted, right? In the criminal context, it isn't because in the criminal context, we're being extra specially careful, right? We have a presumption of innocence. You can't be convicted unless you're guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And in that sort of posture, we say, ah, we're now we're hesitant about hearsay. Um, but there's no presumption of innocence in an impeachment hearing. And the rules of evidence that might make sense would be closer to what you would impose on yourself in making your own careful decision outside of the context of a criminal trial. That's really helpful. So we've we've been seeing a few questions come in around uh, re-election uh, under this under this context. So um, first term president, uh, we can look historically and, and see if we can draw any uh, answers as well. Uh, but we had one question uh, that was was tweeted at you, Barb, that. Uh, asks if the House votes uh, articles of impeachment and the Senate, equi the Senate acquits uh, for lack of a two-thirds majority, could the Senate, by simple majority, vote to prohibit that president from seeking another, f uh, another federal office, um, meaning prohibit them from running for re-election? Um, we also had a, a question within the teach out itself that was getting at, um, some of these same sentiments. So if a president uh, during their first term was impeached and convicted, could they run for office again? Um, if a president uh, was uh, impeached during their first term but not convicted, you know, could they remain in office or could they then run for uh, future office as well? So what are your thoughts on, on those, those questions? Well, with regard to the first one, which mm -hmm. is if the president were acquitted uh, by the Senate, could the Senate do anything to prevent him from um, seeking re-election? I don't think so. I mean, there's mm -hmm. nothing in the Constitution that would do that. I don't think they'd have any authority to do that whatsoever. The more interesting question is, and I'm interested in your thoughts on this, Richard, because of something you said in the first answer, which is, you know, there are a couple things about um, if the president is convicted, it says he shall be removed. But then there's another clause. It doesn't say he shall be prevented from holding office again. It just says he shall be removed. And then there's another section that says um, there's no penalty beyond removal and uh, being barred from office uh, going forward. So it's not clear to me that being barred from office is automatic mm -hmm. upon conviction. I think there's some room for argument there. So a really interesting scenario is this, if President Trump, say, or there's some president, were to be uh, impeached and convicted, could he then, you know, run, November 2020, run for president again? I think that's not clear. I don't think it's clear either. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I mean, it's, it's quite clear that if he is impeached and acquitted, he remains president sure. and he can run again. It's, Bill Clinton. It's, right, that's right. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, well, yeah. although well, run again, it was yeah. a yeah. second sure. term, right? But, but, um, but, but remain but, president, yeah. Um, it's also quite clear uh, that if he is impeached and convicted, um, he could run for Congress, right? The, the president's a Florida resident now. Um, he could, in principle, be impeached and convicted and then run for the U.S. Senate from Florida. We have uh, had instances in the past where a, a federal judge is impeached and then successfully runs for Congress because the position of holding office in Congress, it's not within the impeachment zone, right? You can't be impeached from that position and you're not barred from running for that position. Sure. Um, but I agree with Barb. The question about whether the president is automatically disqualified from holding a future office of the kind that you could be impeached from, president, vice president, uh, cabinet secretary, federal judge, mm -hmm. is not clear. In the past, the standard practice has been that the Senate uh, convicts and removes and the judgment includes a future disqualification. But I think that if the Senate were to vote and say, you know, we vote, you know, two thirds or more of us to remove, um, but not to impose the conviction of disqualification. I, I think the Senate would have a good argument to make that they can do that. And I don't see any mechanism that could second guess them if they said that. That is to say, I mean, this is how you, you know, play out the constitutional law question in the real world. Yeah. Suppose the Senate said that. So we, we remove, but we don't disqualify. And the president runs again, right? If, he, you know, will, 
people, state election officials put his name on the ballot, probably, right? If people vote for him, like then you know, he gets a certain number of electoral votes and forward we go. It's hard for me to imagine a court giving an injunction against that. Against that process, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful insight. I think that uh, another question kind of on the heels of that, that that is coming up through YouTube is thinking about, you know, we, we have, uh, we've only seen this three times in various degrees of the impeachment process. And uh, we've never actually had to remove uh, a sitting president from office. Um, so what does the, the Constitution say about what that process or that timeline looks like? Or does it say anything? Well, so it doesn't say anything explicit about timeline or about uh, processing. It doesn't say who has to go to the president and throw him out of the White House. Right? Sure. I think the assumption has always been if the Senate were to vote by two thirds to remove someone, the president would leave in the same way that the assumption has always been come inauguration day for the next president, the president leaves. And we've been very fortunate through all of American history, actually, that we've had peaceful transfers of power, which is not something that can be taken for granted. If you look around you know, the history of the world in most countries, um, uh, transfers of power are not always peaceful. And there's no magic, right, that says they will be, right? It's good fortune uh, and, you know, good habits that have kept that going here. Um, if a president were to be removed by the Senate, you know, we ought all to hope that the same thing continues, right? That the president says, okay, my time is up and I have to go now. Um, it would be really problematic to have a president who dug in and said, I'm not going anywhere. And the Constitution certainly doesn't specify anything about who does what then. Sure. As a legal matter, that person would not be president. Sure. As a legal matter, as soon as the Senate issues its judgment, the person next in line, right, the vice president probably, um, is the president. Um, but you know, what would be done with a person who refuses to go is not something we've ever had to confront. And Richard, would you agree that the minute they vote, right, and make that decision final, by operation of law, the president is no longer the president, the vice president is the president, and so if, if it came to that, federal officers could go physically remove him from the White House, I would think. I, think. I think they would have to, and he wouldn't have any claim for immunity from any sort of process. He's just a private citizen at that point, like anybody else, mm -hmm. in exactly the same way he is one minute after the next president takes a normal oath of office on January 20th. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. So I'm going to take a, a bit of a pivot, a bit, a bit of a right turn here to talk about whistleblowers. So um, in, in the tea chat, we had a, a, a segment on it. Um, and, you know, we had a couple questions coming up about um, what is uh, a route that someone would take that uh, they would be charged under the Espionage Act versus uh, what is a route that someone would take ver where they would have the legal protections um, that is afforded to them uh, as a whistleblower. Can you kind of go through and explain that process uh, a little bit? Uh, briefly, and then also think about um, comparing it to what, what actually could be charged through espionage. Sure. So um, people who work in the intelligence community and in law enforcement and other uh, sensitive government positions uh, obtain security clearances. It's a condition of their employment that they sign an agreement that I acknowledge I will come into possession of matters that are sensitive and classified, and I understand I've been trained on how to handle them. I agree to comply with those kinds of things. And if I fail to do so, uh, I understand that I could be prosecuted criminally, I could be fired, um, I could be otherwise disciplined. And so everybody understands that I had a clearance, I got training, I had annual renewal of training, I signed documents um, on how you could handle things at various levels. What happens in some of these instances is uh, someone like Edward Snowden or Reality Winner mm -hmm. discover something that deeply troubled them and they thought that they wanted to expose what they perceived as an abuse of power uh, to the world. The challenge there is we want to have an appropriate channel for someone to raise genuine concerns about fraud, waste, and abuse, um, and not to be the sole decision maker mm -hmm. that I get to decide, more than the wisdom of anyone else in my organization, that this is wrong and needs to be shared with the world. And so the route that we want to discourage through the law is for someone to uh, share something with the press that could sure. expose sources and methods of intelligence collection. Um, when you have a source who gets exposed, that could risk someone's life who has been providing, uh, you know, say, information on the inside about Russian intelligence. If we were to expose that person's identity, that could expose that person's um, li uh, to life to danger. It could also cut off 
that source from their effectiveness. If everyone knows they're the mole, they're not going to put them in a position of um, gathering information anymore. Same thing with methods. Um, there are all kinds of surveillance methods that exist in the world, some that we know about from disclosures by Edward Snowden and others, many that we don't know about mm -hmm. publicly. Um, but you know there are surveillance capabilities all over the world, and once those are revealed, we no longer have the ability to utilize those surveillance methods. And so th those are some of the harms to revealing these sources and methods. But with those kinds of secrets is the ability for people to abuse power or to violate the law, either by accident or being too aggressive or purposeful. And we want to provide an outlet for people who discover those kinds of things. And so the idea of whistleblower protection laws is, here is an avenue where you can safely share what you believe to be fraud, waste, or abuse. In the instance that w we've been talking about, um, there is an inspector general uh, for the intelligence community who can receive those reports. They do an initial review to determine whether it's frivolous. You know, if mm -hmm. it's just my boss is a jerk, sure. probably not going to make the cut, yep. but something that is very serious. You know, for example, what we saw here about uh, concerns about a call that the president had with another foreign leader. Um, information, they can pass it up to uh, the inspector general when he makes a determination that number one, it's credible, um, and number two, it's of urgent concern, which has a legal definition. Um, he is to pass it to the director of national intelligence who shall forward it to the intelligence uh, committees of Congress. And I think the requirement that it go to the director of national intelligence is just to give him an opportunity, a heads up. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't say at his discretion sure. or with uh, legal advice. It just says shall forward it to the intelligence committees. Um, in this instance, we had some uh, intermediate review, and so the inspector general himself shared it with the um, intelligence committees to say, um, I'm at an impasse because um, I found something to be credible and of urgent concern. Um, the director of national intelligence took it over to the White House and DOJ, who said no, and it's held up there. Mm -hmm. um, and that for kind of forced the hand of uh, when, when the uh, chair of the House Intelligence Committee revealed that letter, it kind of forced the hand of the White House and DOJ to do something about that, and ultimately they chose to disclose it. Do we have any historical precedent that we can kind of go back to to think about how whistleblowers have impacted something that is this public and this visible for folks? The, the, the most famous instances of whistleblowers I can think of are whistleblowers who probably did not follow the proper avenues. You know, there was Deep Throat in Watergate, uh, who was later revealed to be a very high-level official at the FBI who shared information with Washington Post reporters. Um, there was uh, Daniel Ellsberg, who shared the Pentagon Papers with the New York Times and then the Washington Post, who was someone who had... Um, signed those same agreements where they're not supposed to go that route. And so it's really challenging when we live in a country that values, on the one hand, democracy and an informed electorate so that we can make important decisions about how our country is being run, and on the other, um, protecting our national security and not disclosing matters that are um, in the interest of national security. And so the whistleblower protection laws are designed, many of them were enacted after these instances. Sure. Um, one in 1989 and um, the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act in the 90s. I think to provide this avenue so that people who obtain this information have a legal route and some alternative right. to simply going to the press. And, and there are two layers here, right? W one is the layer of system design, right? Mm -hmm. What set of laws are we going to have for whistleblowers to try to get the best combination we can of information flowing out that needs to get out and security and confidentiality for information that needs to remain secure and confidential, sure. right? And different people might make different decisions and we have to hope that collectively the decision-making process makes the best decisions it can about how to accommodate both of those needs in some system of laws that's going to govern that area. Then there's a second question, which is, once those laws are in place, what do you do when people try to violate or subvert them? Mm -hmm. um, part of the problem now is that uh, people are actively trying to undermine the whistleblower protections that are in place. And regardless of, w I, I, I'm not sufficiently expert, uh, Barb is much more expert than I am in this, um, to know how I might want to change the rule a little bit this way or that way to maximize the beneficial effect of the whole system of rules. Um, but once the rules are in place, 
attempts to violate them or undermine them after the fact send a terrible message to everyone who is then in that system about what they might be vulnerable to and show a basic disrespect for legal decisions that have already been made sure. in a sensitive area because once the rule is there. Sure, great. So I just want to take a moment um, to, to speak to our viewers really quick. So we are uh, having a live stream conversation uh, about impeachment and we want to encourage all of you to submit questions to us uh, via YouTube or Facebook or Twitter and we're happy to uh, include them here in the conversation. Um, so one question that did come through YouTube is thinking about um, the kind of the, the line of uh, presidential power, I, I guess I would say, uh, for after somebody is impeached. So let's, let's say a president is removed from office, um, then who becomes president? Um, if the vice president, um, in, in that case, is also then um, you know, in, in the same bucket and is removed from office, who then would, would become president? Well, by statute, the, the, the Constitution says that Congress gets to make the rules for who would follow the vice president if necessary. Um, and so Congress has created, by statute, a list of who comes next. Um, after the president comes the vice president. After the vice president comes the Speaker of the House of Representatives. After the Speaker of the House of Representatives comes the president pro tem of the Senate, the, the most senior senator. Um, and then after that, the cabinet secretaries in the order in which the departments were established. Yeah. Um, uh, so there's a long line. Yeah. Um, uh, and th uh, this gives rise to the practice when the president has a State of the Union address of designating one person on that line to stay away, right, in case the building falls in on, on everyone else. But we've never had to go down that list. Sure. Um, uh, it's pretty unlikely that anything that is confronting us now would make us go farther down that list, there, th there is a vice president. Um, uh, in one case, uh, the, the case in American history where this probably came closest to mattering was, of course, during the Nixon administration, because before Nixon was impeached and left office, his vice president, Spiro Agnew, uh, was in a lot of trouble uh, himself and resigned. And there was then a vacancy. Um, the vacancy was filled. Congress has the power to approve a president's choice of a replacement vice president, and they filled that vacancy with Gerald Ford. Had they not, and Nixon been impeached, um, then the next person in line would have been the Speaker of the House of Representatives. And one really good thing about the system, the way it works now, where the, the, it goes to the vice president first, is precisely that because the vice president is a person from the president's own political party, someone handpicked by that person, mm -hmm. There shouldn't be concern that the impeachment of a president hands power to the president's political opponents. Mm -hmm. That's not what's happening. It's not as if the Speaker of the House, um, who might be uh, antagonistic to the president politically, gets to come in and it's if you're undoing the results of the president's party's electoral victory. Mm -hmm. You're just handing the power to someone else in that party sure. chosen by that person. Sure. One interesting thing about that, though, is, of course, if the vice president were to be implicated in the same scheme uh, for which the president were to be impeached um, and himself impeached, then we do get into that question of who's next. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, a member of the opposite party, and could that cause senators to sway their vote, thinking about what is the consequence of an impeachment of not only the president or the vice president? And there's also this argument, Richard, I'd be curious if you've heard this, that the language in the Constitution is something like the line of succession will be determined by Congress of civil uh, officers, and there is some argument that a civil officer does not include um, an elected member of Congress in the same way members of Congress can't be impeached because they're not civil officers, and so that their statute is therefore unconstitutional where they say it's the Speaker of the House and then um, the President Pro Tem of the Senate, and so it, instead it would go President, Vice President, and I think Secretary of State is the next, which is what caused Al Haig to famously claim when President Reagan had been shot and the vice president was out of the country, I'm in charge here. Yes. <laughs> so people have made this argument, that is to say people have argued that it's constitutionally improper for the line of succession to go next to the Speaker of the House and that should stay within the executive branch. The question's never been adjudicated, and given the settled expectation that it goes to the Speaker of the House, my guess is that if we ever face that situation, it would go to the Speaker of the House, and people would yell and make arguments that it shouldn't, but the statute has read that way for a long time. I interestingly enough, um, it is probably the case that the line of succession runs that way um, 
uh, because of a much earlier political squabble. Um, that is to say, uh, uh, someone powerful didn't want the Secretary of State to become president um, and pushed it outside. But we all live with that accommodation ever since. So kind of a follow-up question on that um, from, from YouTube again is thinking about um, pardons. Uh, so what is a presidential pardon? And within this context, uh, how has it been used? Uh, and, and what are the scenarios in which it could be used? So a presidential pardon uh, is essentially a get out of jail free card. Um, the president has the power to issue pardons for offenses against the United States, that is to say for federal crimes. Um, the president can't pardon you for a state crime, and most crime in our system is actually state crime. Um, but for a federal crime, the president can issue a pardon. And that means that the effects of whatever sentence you're presently uh, under are alleviated. So you, you, you leave prison, for example, if, 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 if um, uh, if you've been imprisoned. Yeah. There's no such thing as a pardon for an impeachment because an impeachment isn't a criminal conviction. Um, there are questions that people have asked about whether the president issuing a pardon, if it's a deeply improper pardon, could itself be an impeachable offense. Um, you know, suppose there's somebody who has betrayed the United States and been convicted under the espionage laws uh, and the president uh, pardons the person. Maybe the president you know, is su supportive of the espionage, or maybe someone has uh, corruptly stolen you know, millions of dollars in federal funds and been uh, uh, and been convicted, or violated federal election laws in important ways and been convicted. And the president thinks, I don't care about any of those laws, right? Like I like these people. I'm going to pardon them. Could that be the basis for an impeachment? And the answer, as with most such things, is, w well, it could. Um, anything that a president does can be the basis for an impeachment if the Congress decides uh, that it is a sufficient threat to our constitutional system, a sufficient undermining of our constitutional values to warrant removal as a high crime and misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. The pardon itself would still be effective. They can't undo that once it's done. Um, but the fact that it's a get out of jail free card for the person who gets it doesn't mean that the person who gives it is completely unaccountable for the choice. Sure. And one thing to add to that is a president has the ability to issue pardons even if a crime has not yet been charged as long as it has been committed. So I can't give you a hypothetical, uh, you know, if the president were to say, Richard, I pardon you for anything you might ever do in the future. That's not uh, effective. But just as Gerald Ford did, even though President Nixon had not been charged for any crime, uh, you know, he p perhaps could have been charged for violating the federal statute against obstruction of justice, for mm -hmm. example. Um, what he said when he issued his pardon is that he was pardoned for any crimes he may have committed. Um, and so uh, even though he had not been charged with anything, anything that he had done in the past, right. which could form the basis for a criminal charge, uh, he was pardoned for. So yeah. it, it, it's in that way a very broad power. So another question uh, that just came in through YouTube is, generally speaking, um, you know, can a president file an appeal uh, if convicted by the Senate? So similar to <laughs> how we could uh, you know, file an appeal if, if we disagree with a, a decision of a court. How does that play out in this Yeah, scenario? I don't think so. I'm curious to see if Richard has a different opinion. But you know, there's nothing in the Constitution to suggest that there's any higher power, you know, that you could go to a court. It really is the power has been given to impeach in the House and to convict in the Senate shall be removed from office and can even, um, whether by vote or whether it's automatic, uh, bar the president from office, uh, from seeking the presidency again. Um, it does not talk about any power of appeal. It does not even talk about judicial review in any way. So I, I would suggest not, but it is silent on that. So I suppose that suggests that it's not dispositive. Well, I, 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 I think Barb is exactly right. I think there's no possibility of appeal and there's no possibility of judicial review. And um, the, the text of the Constitution says that the Senate has the sole power to try the impeachment. Mm -hmm. And um, the Constitution doesn't say more about that, but the Supreme Court has. Um, the Supreme Court, in fact, has refused to take jurisdiction of uh, an appeal from a conviction of a federal judge who was impeached and convicted and removed mm -hmm. and who wanted to say the process by which I was impeached uh, was improper and you, the court, should reverse my impeachment. And the Supreme Court, in a decision by Chief Justice Rehnquist, said, no way, we don't do that. This decision is committed 
to the discretion of Congress, and we don't second guess it. And that recognition, I think, is part of um, something really fundamental and difficult sometimes to understand because a little bit counterintuitive, but really important about impeachment, which is it's not strictly speaking a legal process where in the context where you think of legal as something that happens in courts and not in Congress. Sure. It's a constitutional process that sits somewhere between the ordinary work of a legislature and the work of a court. It has many questions of law and constitutionality involved in it, but it's not a decision for a court. It's a decision under the Constitution for Congress. So building on that, um, we just have a couple minutes left here in, in this live stream, but I wanted to uh, bring up a couple questions uh, that, that relate to your last point here. So Evan and, and John within the Teach Out itself um, asked, uh, you know, the Constitution was drafted before our, our two-party system evolved. Um, how would you overhaul the impeachment process in light of our, our current, current knowledge? I think it's a wonderful question. But I think the thing that would have to be overhauled isn't the impeachment process, it's the two-party system. If you have a two-party system where the parties have you know, roughly equal power and uh, at least one party is deeply committed to not cooperating at all, to just being fully intransigent, um, the impeachment system won't work. And there's no way to design around that. The system would work if uh, you had an impeachment process with political parties of any number where people were w willing to confront cases on their merits uh, and not stay in lockstep with their parties. If you're going to have political parties where everyone is going to stay in lockstep, it's very difficult to imagine um, an impeachment process working. Um, there are some problems in human behavior that can't be solved with systems of rules. They can only be solved by people having the right attitude about what they're going to do within the process. And, uh, and this is one of them. Sure. And, and I would say, I don't know that it needs to be fixed. I mean, it is very frustrating, I think, at times to watch a party be so united behind uh, its leader that it seems to be willing to violate the rule of law. But ultimately, they're all accountable at the ballot box. And so it may be longer than people might uh, want or, or, or to seem ideal. But ultimately, if people are dissatisfied with uh, the conduct of their senators, then they have the ability to vote them out of office. So I definitely agree with this. Um, uh, and there's one, I think, important thing that you know, ought to be said in addition to it, which is normally we don't impeach officials, presidents or otherwise, who've misbehaved because the normal remedy in our system is electoral and should be. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that would make it most compelling, most necessary to remove a president would be when the electoral remedy isn't there because the election itself is under threat and can't be trusted. And part of what is at issue in the, well, part of what was at issue in Watergate, part of why uh, Nixon's actions were seen as so damaging and as requiring impeachment and removal, were that the things that Nixon had done went directly to the integrity of the electoral system. That is to say, he authorized and covered up um, an, a, an attack on his political rivals organization. Um, an attack on something that undermines the integrity of the electoral system removes the reliability of the electoral check and leaves us with nothing but impeachment or removal. That is to say, you can't say, don't use impeachment, use the election, when the reason you need to impeach is that if we don't impeach, the election is going to be tarnished. Sure. Yeah, that's that's a really helpful uh, last point there. So. Um, are there any other final uh, points that either of you want to make uh, to help contextualize uh, the process of impeachment, thinking about historical reflections or current implications? The only thing I would add is um, the incredible importance of an engaged citizenry to understand what's going on in our society. And so teach outs like this are wonderful. Um, it's important that people understand. I think that there are sometimes politicians who deliberately use misleading language and try to confuse the public so they'll throw up their hands and just say, I can't make sense of any of it. I'm just going to tune it out and get on with my life. I think it's essential that all, all Americans are paying attention to what's going on because um, our votes matter and holding all of our elected representatives accountable matters. Great. 
I think Barb is exactly right. All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Barb, for joining us in this conversation. Thanks, Benjamin. Glad to be here. And thank you, Richard, for again coming back and uh, having this conversation about impeachment. Thanks for having me. Great. And thank you to all of our viewers who tuned in live for this conversation uh, about impeachment. We want to encourage all of you to jump into the Teach Out, uh, which is available on Coursera. Uh, the link is in our YouTube description. And uh, thank you again for joining us. Have a wonderful day.